In the 17th century, a large assembly from the Church of England gathered together to draw up a catechism in what would come to be known as the Westminster Confession of Faith. This catechism has since been subscribed to largely by Reformed Christians, i.e. Calvinists, around the world as their primary standard of doctrine. In the 17th chapter of the Westminster Confession of Faith, we read the following concerning the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints. The perseverance of the saints depends not upon man's free will, but upon the immutability of the decree of election. Here we see that according to the Calvinist's catechism, perseverance is something that is ultimately and finally dependent not upon man's free will, but upon God's sovereign decree. For those who might be unfamiliar with the Calvinist position that rose to prominence during the 16th century Protestant Reformation, their theology maintains that God arbitrarily predetermines all those who will and will not go to heaven. In conjunction with this, they assert that if someone appears to be a Christian for a time, then completely and totally falls away from God, it simply means that God sovereignly decided not to give that particular person the gift of perseverance unto final salvation, and thus they were never truly elected by God in the first place. In light of this Calvinistic perspective, I wanted to draw our attention to a couple of verses that we find throughout the Bible in order to demonstrate the fact that the perseverance of the saints' doctrine is ultimately irreconcilable with the full counsel of the scriptures, in so much that perseverance is to be understood not as a gift given to some at the exclusion of others, but as an attribute of God's divine character that he makes available to all that freely choose to follow after him in accordance with their own free choice. Turning first to the second epistle of Peter, we begin by reading the following. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, for his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness, through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. Through these, he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises, so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world on account of lust. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance, and to perseverance godliness, and to godliness brotherly affection, and to brotherly affection, love. In these first seven verses, Peter reveals that God, by his divine power, has made available to us all the magnificent gifts pertaining to life and godliness, in order that we might become partakers of the divine nature. Peter then goes on by clearly instructing us as believers to make every effort to add to our faith these attributes of God's divine character, one of them being perseverance itself. Right away, we see that Peter strikes a perfect biblical balance between God's sovereignty, whereby he presents salvation to mankind through his outstretched arm, and man's responsibility, whereby we are called to partake and embrace the gifts which he has provided to us. When Peter says to add to your faith, the Greek word for add is found in the imperative mood, which indicates that it is a command or request. The plain reading of this passage clearly makes it known that as believers we are being commanded to walk in perseverance in accordance with our own volition. Furthermore, not only does Peter exhort us to diligently partake in the divine nature which God has gifted to us, he continues in the next several verses by instructing us to practice these things in order to prevent ourselves from becoming unfruitful and falling away. For picking back up in verse 8, we read the following. For if these things are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these things is blind or short-sighted, having forgotten his purification from his former sins. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to make your calling and election sure. For if you practice these things, you will never fall. For in this way the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will be richly supplied to you. 
Again, Peter emphatically reveals that we as Christians have a responsibility to persevere in our election by diligently putting into practice the aforementioned attributes of God's divine nature. For only in doing so will an entrance into the eternal kingdom of God be richly supplied to us, he says. Thus, we find that we as Christians are called to add perseverance to our faith, not simply that we might prevent ourselves from temporarily incurring God's displeasure, but that we might confirm and make certain his calling and election of us. This language unequivocally reveals that God's final election and choosing of us is not based on God's prior sovereign decree, but upon our willingness to diligently practice and abide in the grace which he has granted and made available to us. If perseverance did not in any way depend upon our own free will, then Peter would not have to command it of us. The fact that Peter instructs us to add perseverance to our faith indicates that it is in part our responsibility. Additionally, in 1 Timothy chapter 6, we find the Apostle Paul also exhorting and commanding the men of God to flee in morality and earnestly seek after the things of God which come from above. For he says, But you, man of God, flee from all this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Not only does Paul command us to pursue perseverance, love, faith, etc., he exhorts us to fight the good fight of faith and uphold our confession by taking hold of the eternal life to which we have been called. In order for Calvinist and Reformed Christians to harmonize these types of passages with their unique theological perspective, they must interpret them in a very abstract manner, rendering the language as purely descriptive rather than prescriptive, making the commands moot for all intents and purposes, since again, Paul would not have to command the men of God to fight the good fight and take hold of eternal life to which they were called if they were ultimately incapable of doing otherwise. The fact of the matter is, the plain reading of the aforementioned text clearly contradicts the strict perseverance of the saint's perspective. In the epistle of James, he explains to us that perseverance isn't a characteristic that is automatically generated within some of us to start. Rather, it is something that is cultivated within us as we faithfully endure various trials and tribulations. Like gold being refined through fire, so we obtain the characteristic of perseverance by faithfully withstanding God's testing in our life. For we read, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work, so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. It's important to note that the concepts found within the perseverance of the saints doctrine were completely foreign to the orthodox teachings of the church for the first 1500 years of Christianity, with the early 1st and 2nd century church explicitly opposing such Gnostic ideas as false. One of the most vocal apostolic church leaders on the subject was Justin the Martyr, who stated the following. And again, unless the human race have the power of avoiding evil and choosing good by free choice, they are not accountable for their actions, of whatever kind they be. But that it is by free choice, they both walk uprightly and stumble, we thus demonstrate. We see the same man making transition to opposite things. Now, if it had been fated that he were to be either good or bad, he could never have been capable of both the opposites, nor of so many transitions. But not even would some be good and others bad, since we thus make fate the cause of evil. Another prominent voice who explicitly spoke out against this idea was Origen, who though having differing views on various things himself, acknowledged that there were certain core principles that were handed down by the church with the utmost of clarity, of which there was no dispute. Of these core principles, he states, this is also clearly defined in the teachings of the church, that every rational soul is possessed of free will and volition, that it has a struggle to maintain with the devil and his angels and opposing influences, because they strive to burden it with sins. But if we live rightly and wisely, 
we should endeavor to shake ourselves free of a burden of that kind, from which it follows also that we understand ourselves not to be subject to necessity, so as to be compelled by all means, even against our will, to do either good or evil. For if we are our own masters, some influences perhaps may impel us to sin, and others help us to salvation. We are not forced, however, by any necessity, either to act rightly or wrongly. The teaching passed down by the apostles to their disciples was that God has always preserved the power of self-government in man to rightly choose between good and evil, and that such choices are not based on fate or necessity. Within the early church and the scriptures, we find that there is always a balance placed upon God's divine power being gifted to us and man's responsibility to walk in that power. Therefore, while God is the author and initiator of our salvation, it is still our final decision as to whether or not we want to walk in the divine nature which God has provided to us or reject it. Now, I hope this video has helped to provide some clarity in order that you might become better acquainted with the plain reading of the scriptures and the clear teaching handed down by the early apostolic church leaders themselves. So if you guys have any further thoughts or questions on this topic, feel free to drop a comment below. Otherwise, I'll see you guys in the next one.